Hey guys, welcome back to Laser Everything. I'm Kyle, and today we're going to be covering four tools you might not have known about in Lightburn. Hang tight, because we're getting started right now. So first tool first, we're going to be handling Trace. So I just have a free logo here that I grabbed off of the internet. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. And it's just a little dog with a toothbrush. Maybe this is a dentist office and they want some, some products made for their employees or something. Well, this is all we have to work with is a photo. So maybe we need to scale this to a product that would make the available detail in this image not maybe look so great once it's scaled up. And that's the beauty about working with vectors is you can scale it infinitely. So what I'm going to do is we're gonna turn this into a vector. So I'm going to right click hit trace image and we get this pop-up. Now this pop-up is going to give us a preview window. Now, first thing I'm going to share is I can click and drag and make a box and I can only trace a section of the area of the image. So if we only need a trace from one spot, we can very specifically box in that area and work with just that spot. I want the whole image, so I'm going back to having everything highlighted, which is how it starts. But in case you accidentally left click on something and get stuck and have to start over, you don't need to do that. Just zoom out, highlight what you want. And trace works off of a threshold system, essentially. These gradients, it can sometimes have a hard time with. So we want to move, starting with this threshold in this case, up or down to meet this gradient so we get the whole image if possible. Sometimes we get lucky, sometimes we don't. In cases where we don't, we can simply do a second trace to capture everything at a different threshold and cutoff, or we can also try adjusting the cutoff to get what we need. So I'm going to shift this up, and you'll see that the gradient is now moving away. We don't want that. We want to capture everything. So I'm going to scroll down instead, and we just got everything there. So 108. So the numbers here are a little bit arbitrary, but um, essentially it's all going to change based off the colors in the image that you're working with. So cool, we got what we need out of this image, but what are the rest of the options here? So ignore less than is an option where you can ignore small fine details if you wanted just a very basic trace. So if I say ignore less than two, it's going to ignore pixel counts grouped together in the same color that are less than that quantity. Now for smoothness, that is the next option here. So what we're looking at is curves, or at least it's, it's more easily identified in curves. So if I pick one of these teeth, and I zoom in just a bit, if I scroll up on the smoothness, it's going to essentially allow more curve into the design passively by allowing more nodes almost. Now, if I scroll down, it's going to try simplifying it. And sometimes you'll see the line shift, a little shift here. And you can notice it's a little more jumpy. So if I scroll up, you'll see that this is turning into more of an arch and we're basically back to where we were. You know what? We're gonna talk about another button to make this a little easier to see. I'm gonna hit the fade image button. What that's going to do is fade the image into the background and let us see what our vector lines are looking like from this trace. Hit fade, you can see this nice hard angle. And again, I'm just gonna smooth up, smooth down, smooth up, smooth down. So that's the power of smooth. Now in some cases, you don't want that. Sometimes you need those hard edges. So you may wanna turn this down. A lot of the time, I find that Lightburn's very good with it and I don't really have to adjust it too much. I almost never change smoothness. So I almost always leave that at one. So we only have a couple things left here. We have show points. So if we hit show points, it's going to show essentially what the nodes are doing in here. And you'll see a lot of these sweeping curves. Now, if I scroll up on optimize, you're gonna notice that a lot of these are disappearing. And as we scroll down below the default value, it's actually adding in more. This is the default. And now we're going up and up in the less nodes we have. Now, if you've got a very, very complex design, changing it can help. So show points can be powerful for that. Now that we're in the home stretch now, clear boundary. So before we 
we talked about left clicking and outlining a shape maybe that we needed. Maybe we didn't intend to do that. What we can do is we can hit clear boundary and that's just going to default and reset to the whole image that we're tracing. Then we have delete image after trace. Now what this is going to do, obviously we have the image in the background that you can see that we put in that we're tracing. It's going to remove that layer completely and it's going to only have the vector when you hit OK with this checked. If you don't have that checked, it's going to pop the vector uh, in line essentially with the image on a different layer. Because you have an image layer and then a vector layer. So if you need to do something else with that image or you want to keep it as a reference, turn that off. If you don't need the image after tracing it, you can turn that on. Now last but not least, we have Sketch Trace. Now Sketch Trace is more designed for handwriting, like for example, recipes. Sketch Trace is great for that. Handwriting in general, fantastic. Or actual line drawings, uh, fantastic. Again, not something we're gonna need here. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip that. With that said, we're gonna go forward. Uh, I'm happy with the results here. I shifted the threshold down, like I said before. And we're gonna proceed with delete image after trace. And you'll notice the image is gone. We can see through our vector shape here. And we can scale this now infinitely without losing detail because we're working with calculated nodes and we're no longer working with a dithered shape. That also gives us extra options in our cuts and layers. So if I bring that image back in, you'll notice just as a final tip that we get less options when it comes to what we can do with the layer. We can't pick multiple scan angles. We can't add multiple layers, sub layers rather, and we can't rotate our, our cut angle in an automated way. However, let's cancel this and we're gonna go to the vector layer. We can do auto rotate. We can treat it as a vector fill layer and it gives us a lot more power to do other things with this kind of design. All right, so now that we're all done with that tool, we're moving on to warp. So if I just type laser everything, and I go ahead and go to tools, warp selection, what we can do is we can hold shift or control. Those are the modifier keys for this tool. If we just drag one, it'll drag one. We can kind of warp the text. So maybe we're shaping it to fit onto a shape that we're engraving onto already. Or maybe we have a image design or a vector shape already that we need to fit text into. We want to stretch it and fill that space. You can do this without having to leave light burn. And another thing, if you double click on uh, a node, it resets its position back to original. So I'm gonna go ahead and use shift and we're going to modify this. And you'll notice it's moving both the top nodes for me. Now you can see very quickly that the scrolling text, it can make it look like it's moving far away. Kind of like the scrolling text at the beginning of a very specific movie. So you can get lots of cool little effects with this. Um, and another option, uh, when you do control, should be the opposite way. So with shift, we have horizontal, and with control, we would have vertical symmetry. Another, for example, use case of this, uh, when engraving, uh, like a dice design, and you wanna add some dimensional depth to the text, you can simply make the letter, or the number in this case, and you can then warp it to match the angle that you need to be. Uh, another way uh, that this can be used is actually when engraving on shapes that aren't flat uh, or, or on the same plane, they're tapered. So if they have a true taper, you can use this to modify uh, how it's viewed. So if, for example, the image that you're engraving onto a shape uh, would otherwise look skewed on the thing that you're engraving it onto. You can pre-skew it to combat that. And with that, let's move on to deform. I'm gonna go back to our old little dog friend here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the shape I want to start messing with. I'm going to go into tools, 
deform. It's right under warp. It gives you, you'll notice four points versus 16 points here between these two tools. So deform very much is almost the same as warp. So what we can do, we'll zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to hold shift again and you'll notice we can kind of work this around a little bit and we can skew this out in such a way or deform it out in such a way that it does what we want it to do. And it gives us 16 points to work with. So let's say we want to skew everything this way or maybe this way and fill out the bottom a little bit more. You have these options to basically make it do what you want it to do. You do have 12 more points of detail essentially to work with. Again, this is great for working with maybe wavy objects too. You can warp and deform your image to work with the flow of an object that doesn't have a consistent height on your Galvo laser, for example. And we're gonna go over to the photo now. We still have 16 points and it works just like that. Now you will notice the image kind of disappears as we shift it around but that's just because it needs to generate essentially the new image as it goes. And just a final note about deform as well. Let's say you have a curve and you want text to follow the curve. What you have or what you have the ability to do, you already have this curve option here with text. However, if you have something more complex, let's say you wanna fill the tapered edge of a knife blade, for example or maybe uh, a, a watch that has a very specific shape on the back. It's not a perfect circle. The deform and also warp respectively um, allow you to fill that shape while previewing it on your Galvo laser as an example and be able to work with and make the most of that space, uh, which is especially great if you can't necessarily map out all the intricacies of the difference. Um, that you're working within. So um, you can manipulate and adjust it and then frame it with your Galvo to determine whether or not you're meeting up with the expectations of the object you're working with. Now the last tool is being able to run multiple instances of Lightburn and being able to connect to multiple lasers. So what I have here, uh, I have this instance of Lightburn set to my laser only. 100 watt fiber laser. And what I can do is I can go turn that laser on it will auto connect as it does normally. And let's say I go ahead and connect that, but I wanna maybe do some work on my, my big CO2 laser back there. Well, what I can do, being that I'm on Windows, I have the ability to double click on the Lightburn icon on my desktop and launch another instance of Lightburn. Or I can use my center mouse button and click on the Lightburn logo on my toolbar and that will open up another one. I'm gonna close that. There's a third way uh, that Lightburn has introduced in opening additional instances of Lightburn. If we go up to File and we go to New Window, not New, but New Window, that will open up another instance of Lightburn. This is the Ruida 6445G. That is my big CO2 laser back there. If I go ahead and turn that on and I get a, a nice engrave and cut job going on that, maybe I wanna do some more work on the UV. Well, what I can do is I can go ahead and pull up the UV and I can plug that in. I can open another new window and I can have the Ruida and the UV going and then I can open another window and I could have the Wisely 300 lens going. I could have all of these lasers going at a time. Now, the tip that I have for you is that when you're connecting multiple lasers, it is very challenging for Lightburn to know which one's which. So the control cards on fiber Galvo lasers, for example, where I have multiple, they have the same control card. So Lightburn may automatically connect to another machine that's on if there isn't already a Lightburn instance connected to it. So you need to make sure you're setting the device before turning the device on or else it may lead to freezing problems with the software. You might get stuck. So just a little tip there. Um, that has gotten better in recent updates, so that may not be as big of a problem as it is now, but that's it. I've run up to seven or eight instances of Lightburn 
uh, for seven or eight different lasers at the same time. At that point, you're more at your head bandwidth than you are at the light burn bandwidth. And another factor is the limitation on that would be, again, your system. So if your system only has eight gigabytes of RAM, if you're running a lot of complex designs, that could be a little bit problematic and slow things down a little bit. But uh, that's it for tips on this. I hope you all enjoyed and got use out of it. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.